Continuing production of The Open Mind has been made possible by grants from Ann Olnick Gumowitz, the Engelson Family Foundation, the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, the Joan Gans Cooney and Peter G. Peterson Fund, the Rosalind P. Walter Foundation, the Joanne and Kenneth Wellner Foundation, Sally Menard and Norton Garfinkel, and from the corporate community, Mutual of America. I'm Alexander Hefner, your host on The Open Mind. When I was the Fitzwater Fellow in Public Communications at Franklin Pierce University last fall in the deeply rural New Hampshire wilderness of Ringe, the epidemic of heroin abuse across the state was not an abstract case study, but rather an intimate mass death sentence afflicting the young people I met. In response to the plight of rural addiction and a long-neglected urban crisis, we invited Center for Disease Control and Prevention Director Tom Frieden and more recently Rob Reiner, director of Being Charlie, whose son suffered from what our guest today calls a disease of free will. We continue this critically important conversation with distinguished Mexican-born psychiatrist and scientist Dr. Nora Valkoff, who leads the National Institute on Drug Abuse within the NIH, the world's largest research depository on addiction. This general in the drug war, as the New York Times chronicled, has pioneered the use of brain imagery to investigate the toxic effects of abusable drugs. As her research on the addictive properties of these chemicals has accelerated, so too has the rate of dependence. So I want to ask Nora first for a progress report. And welcome. Thank you. It's such a pleasure to have you here. Well, thanks for having me. And uh, in terms of uh, progress report, and the progress report is what you were saying in New Hampshire. It's not unique to New Hampshire. Um, in fact, we've seen a significant increase in people um, injecting heroin and uh, now um, addicted to prescription opioid medication. And this is translated into really a very devastating epi epidemic of people becoming addicted to these medications, but dying from them from overdoses. And it's basically right now, uh, every 20 minutes, there is an American that dies uh, from an overdose on a prescription. And that gets you an idea of a state of the art. It's very tragic and it's very unfortunate. And that's one of the, the I think, our obligation to come up with strategies to revert this epidemic, which is very different from other types of um, addictions because these are medications that are given by physicians and um, they, Physicians give them in principle to treat pain, to help patients, and unbeknownst to them, uh, these patients may be taking higher doses or they're diverting their medication. And we are, as a result of that, amidst this uh, one of the most devastating epidemics that we have in, in our country. The basic vicious cycle, as I understand it, and do correct me if I'm wrong, is the overprescription of painkillers to some extent leading to the heroin use, the unprecedented heroin use. Effectively, uh, we recognize that uh, this uh, e epidemic on opioid um, abuse uh, emerged as the number of prescriptions increased dramatically around 2000. And there was a change that, again, was very well intended by the Joint Accreditation Committee, uh, Committee for Hospitals that require, if you wanted to be accredited as a hospital, you have to not only screen for pain, but treat the pain in your patients. Then physicians following these guidelines start to actually prescribe opioids. Why? Because opioids are the most effective medications that we have for the treatment of severe acute pain. But it follows in their brains that if someone had pain, um, they started to prescribe them beyond severe to start to prescribe them for moderate. And then they started to prescribe if it works for acute, then it should work for chronic without no evidence whatsoever that the medications would be beneficial for any type of chronic pain and without an understanding that while these opioid medications can be very effective for severe acute pain, they're also highly rewarding. 
and they have effects in the brain that are not different from those of heroin that actually result, yes, in very powerful anesthesia, uh, analgesia, but also very potent reward and triggering in those that are vulnerable that changes that result in addiction. So as a person becomes addicted to their opioid medications, uh, I mean, and I miss this uh, increase in, in the number of prescriptions, there has been an attempt to make uh, decrease those prescriptions and make it harder to get. So a person is already addicted to prescription opioids, then they transfer to heroin because heroin is much more widely available in many places and it's cheaper. And so is, that's how the transition appears to have happened. And it's estimated that out of uh, three out of four new heroin abusers um, went into heroin first by abusing opioid prescriptions. And, and in parallel to this, there has been an entry of very pure heroin coming from Mexico uh, that has decreased not just its price, increased its availability, but also the more potent the heroin, the purer it is, the higher the likelihood that you can overdose. In parallel, another um, circumstance that has made this issue even more severe is that um, heroin started, has started to be mixed with fentanyl. Fentanyl is an opioid medication, probably one of the most potent that we have, 10 or 20 times more potent than heroin. So they mix the heroin with fentanyl, you have a very potent drug. And that in turn, though, while it gives a very strong um, experience to that drug user also increases significantly the rate of uh, death and fatalities from overdoses. You related the science in a way that was quite understandable to me as a chocolate lover, mm -hmm. a fellow chocolate lover at this table. It is a question of self-control and a question of a kind of medicine, a would-be medicine turned into an addictive drug that rewires you. Is it as simple as self-control and once it's beyond one's control, how can the science remedy the problem? Yeah, and, because and you are a chocolate lover, you know. I love chocolates. I love black chocolates. I, uh, but I, I, and actually, I can lose control over eating cho uh, so uh, black I? chocolates. But most of the time, I'm I'm on control. And I think that we all have to be honest with ourselves. And when we are faced with something that's rewarding that we like. Most of the time, we may be able to actually consume as much as we wanted to um, or abstain from consuming. But there are certain circumstances, if we are very frustrated, if we are very tired, if we are very bored, that we give in and we overconsume. But most of the time, we are OK. When you transition from that stage where most of the time you are able to self-regulate the desires and control and manage your behavior, even though you want to do it, you say it's not a good idea. When you lose that capacity consistently, that's when you start to get into the transition of addiction. And, and what do we know about it? We know about it uh, that, and, and very much emerging as uh, investigating the brains of people that are addicted and comparing them with people that are not addicted. And one of the main differences is dysfunction of areas of the brain in the frontal cortex uh, in people that are addicted. Now, this is uh, important because the frontal cortex is necessary for you to make a decision, to analyze a situation, make a decision, and carry it through. But if these areas of the brain are not functioning properly, which is what the repeated drug use does to your brain, it erodes the capacity of frontal cortical areas, then your ability to self-regulate, your ability to make optimal decision gets dysfunctional. In a very simple metaphor, and, and, and I use this because we always um, judge and interpret the way, of course, in the basis of our experience. So if you've never been addicted to drugs, you say, well, why doesn't that person just stop taking it and get their act together? Because we're seeing it from our perspective, and we know that we can exert control and free will. And most of the time, we're able to do it. But we need these areas of the frontal cortex in order to be able to do it. If those areas are not functioning, it's literally like driving a car without brakes. So you can cognitively say, I, and there's a person crossing, and say, I'm going to break, so I, cannot, I don't want to hurt this person. And you don't want to hurt that person. But if you don't have brakes, how do you do it? We spoke with Tom Frieden in depth about new guidelines that have recently been unveiled to address this problem of over-prescribing within the medical realm. But I really want to talk to you, Nora, about the addicted and how to put those breaks back in place. And it's not a one-step process. 
we were speaking in the green room about efforts in Vancouver, Canada, and now Ithaca, New York, where there are facilities being designed to allow, in a regulated environment, those addicted to shoot up. That seems like a first course in what is um, a longer journey back to, you know, reversing the damage that you describe. Yeah, no, and, and, and that, so the issue is what can you do to improve the function of the brain in such a way that that individual um, will be better able not just to resist the temptation of the drugs, which are very, very strong drives and motivators of behavior in them, but actually allow them to recover and, um, and lead uh, normal, normal lives without having to be worried about having to take drugs and the rituals. So what can we do? Well, we, we know certain things that we should remove from the experience of the individuals, and one, one of them is stressors. Social stressors are probably one of the most harmful effects to your brain in terms of uh, they can disrupt your ability of exerting control. So I say it's drugs, drugs damage these systems, but so does um, chronic social stress. And particularly is sensitive are children and adolescents, but we are all are. So if you take an, an individual and that person is withdrawn and society is rejecting them and they are thrown to jail, those are massive stressors that are not going to help the brain recover. So what is it that we can, uh, we can do to recover? We have to provide them an environment where you minimize the social stressors, item number one. So, which explains why throwing someone that's addicted into prison or jail is not just ineffective. Actually, it can further hamper the ability of that individual to successfully be able to recover from their addiction. It actually can do damage. That's, that's number one. Number two, how do you provide this stability? And for those uh, addictions, and so as the case of opioids, there are medications that can actually can facilitate very much creating a stable physiological state for your body that will facilitate your capacity to actually lead a normal life. And what do I mean by, uh, by that? Medica when, when you're addicted to opioids, you actually have uh, physical changes in your brain, not just they are disrupting the actual capacity to exert self-control, but the areas of the brain that are associated with mood are um, basically driven towards, normally we have this stage of positive and negative moods. When you are addicted, you actually become much more sensitive to having a reaction that results in a negative emotion like anxiety, depression. And when you are taking drugs and the drugs are leaving your system, one of the reasons that leads you to want to take more is this very negative emotion, dysphoria, irritability. Medications allow you to stabilize that, which in turn allows you to lead a normal, productive life. And, and consistently, by many independent studies, uh, it has been shown, in fact, that medication treatments, whether it is agonist or antagonist, and that's methadone, buprenorphine, naltrexone, or naltrexone extended release, Vivitrol, helps the person um, stay in treatment, uh, incorporate into, um, into their lives and recover, and it also prevents them from overdoses. And it also prevents them, those that are addicted to prescription opioids, to transitioning into heroin. So medication treatments are one of the interventions that can help stabilize, and as you stabilize, the brain is very neuroplastic, so it has tremendous ability for recovery. So like now, for example, someone suffering from a stroke, we do rehabilitation treatment so that they can be able to move the affected area of their body by compensating. So we can do interventions that will allow that person to be able to compensate or uh, recover those areas that have been affected by the repeated use of drugs. And that's the aim of treatment. But it, it's a name that it doesn't happen overnight, that, and which is another issue that people have a misconception. They have the sense, and it will be incredible, that, OK, I give you an antibiotic and you are cured two weeks later. It will be extraordinary that we have such a thing for right. addiction. We don't. And the changes are very long lasting. So it's more like hypertension or diabetes. You need to be in treatment for a long period of time. Also, what about the social conditions, maybe the economic malaise or disempowerment that led folks to shoot up in the first place, 
how do you ensure that be after the intervention those conditions in society are not recreated and you're actually touching on something that we've all recognized in, in treatment, that we have someone that is um, addicted to a drug and we treat them in a specialized treatment facility. And say after three months, the person goes back to the same environment that is surrounded by all of these social cues, some of them stressor, but also one of the things that our brain does is that when you have anything that's very rewarding, you create a new memory that will drive your behavior when you are in that space or place or with that person uh, to want to experience that same um, situation as you did. So that generates a desire to take drugs. So this is an incredible challenge because it's not like you say, okay, you've been to treatment, let's bring you into another city. <laughs> but one of the things that we can do, and again, there are, are certain changes that can be done at the structure. Currently, if you have been in prison, then you may be a, a drug abuser and addicted to drugs, and then you are released, it's going to be much harder for you to get uh, an education, to get educational grants. It's going to be much higher for you to get a job. And being jobless is highly stressful. So when there are these opportunity to change those laws so that the person that has um, been in the criminal justice system that is interested on stopping taking drugs can be given an environment that is going to be more likely for him to succeed in um, achieving the recovery. So we can do structural changes to compensate for the stressors in the environment that the person is going to return to. But it's not going to happen automatically because in many of the current systems, unfortunately, they are still many roadblocks that are making it much harder for the person that's addicted to drugs to stop taking it. You say quite compellingly that the science and the politics here are intertwined insofar as the movement to ban the box so that people who are leaving the criminal justice system or leaving the facilities that we talk about are eligible to be employed and have an economic livelihood. What do you think in terms of the nature of this problem is that most um, troublesome or fundamental kind of underlying cue? We talk about social cue. Is it an economic cue? I wish it would be very easy to my brain to say you it's this one and pinpoint and this is the one. And definitely you are touching on the notion of economic resources. So you need to have an infrastructure that will be able to provide the treatment that the person needs. And that requires, of course, resources. But it's more than that, because I also think that a word that we use a lot to the point that we no longer register, but it's a, a, a key component, is stigma. And I have again and again people coming to me their relatives or themselves saying um, to telling me, no, I am addicted to this or that drug or my son or my sister is addicted to do. And they are so ashamed. And I am ashamed. Hmm. They are incorporating the stigma into themselves. Now, what are the consequences? That stigma leads them to be afraid to seek treat, uh, treatment. That stigma leads the physician or the healthcare system not to want to address it. And that stigma leads to actually not identifying uh, the resources that are necessary because it's not considered um, a condition or a disease as other diseases like Alzheimer's or cancer, where everybody feels immediate empathy. A addiction is not per se a disease where you generate empathy. And yet the person that's addicted uh, is probably suffering from one of the most devastating diseases. If you, if you can just think about what it means that you cannot control yourself, no matter how hard you try, and that you're ashamed of that and you blame yourself, what other disease does that? Mental illnesses. Mental, and they've been stigmatized for decades, but you said to me off camera that it's important to view the framework of policy today in a historical lens. Correct. I, I think that we are living at unprecedented times and and on an unfortunate way, the tragic situation that happens on the prescription opioid epidemic and heroin um, is a result of our negligence uh, in the healthcare system about addiction. And we, we in the healthcare system have never thought it's part of our responsibility. We don't get trained as medical students, even in specialty. In I am a psychiatrist in the residency of psychiatry. The average number of hours that you get trained on in addiction, even though it's one of the mental illness, highly comorbid with psychiatric diseases, patients with psychiatric diseases are at greater risk of mortality because of addiction. 
we don't get trained properly. So that is one of the main issues that needs to be addressed. We need, we need to actually change it. The lack of recognition of, the, of its importance has resulted in the situations that we currently are. And that's one. On the other hand, that has made, because of the overdoses, everybody aware that we need to educate on the uh, healthcare system about addiction. And the other side is we also need to educate on pain because there is also the need of patients suffering from pain. How are they going to be treated? Uh, I, I actually, we need to recognize that this is an area that we have to put resources to come with alternatives that will help those patients suffering from pain. But apart from this, there's been two developments that are actually very fundamental right now and enable us to change the culture of addiction from criminal to healthcare. One of them is the parity law. So the parity law allows us now to uh, have insurances, it requires insurances to cover for the treatment of substance use disorders and other mental illnesses, like any other medical disease. You cannot discriminate, which has been consistently all, all along. And the other one is healthcare reform. Because healthcare reform is providing for the first time insurance to many individuals suffering from a substance use disorder or for addiction. So for the first time, these individuals have an insurance and now the insurance based on the law, it's the law, has to pay for their treatment. Now you would say that, that those two very important advances would have um, transformed the treatment of uh, people uh, that are addicted to drugs. And unfortunately, it hasn't. Even though now there is this structure that should have allowed, there are still many roadblocks that result in patients not getting the treatment that they, they would benefit from. I want to ask you why, in the context of delivering testimony before the U.S. Congress, and what the disconnect might have been there in your testimony based on the questions that you got, so why hasn't it transformed, and is it because of anything that you discerned when you were delivering the testimony and saw the feedback from our elected officials? Well, I think that one of the issues why it hasn't happened is that when you have a, a culture and a tradition of um, treating patients in a certain way, even if there's a new law, it, it, you don't see the transformation right away. Why to start with? Uh, the physicians, the nurses, the, the nurse practitioners are not trained into properly actually screen or treat people with substance use disorder. So they tell you you should be screening and then physicians are afraid. And if I ask them the question and they say, yes, what do I do? So it's better not to ask. So it, this is probably one of the most important issues that we need to address, the proper training and education of uh, individuals in the healthcare system so that they can properly deal with it. You think there's a lot of that not asking and not telling still going on? There is still a lot going on of not asking, and I, and I think that I, I, it, it hurts me enormously when I think about it, and I don't per se actually, but I use it nonetheless because I illustrate um, Seymour Hoffman. He was given an opioid medication for pain, and no one asked him had he been addicted in the past. Had they asked that question, they perhaps would have not prescribed an opioid medication. So, and we see that, for example, in terms of patients that are given an opioid prescription, that are giving these medications without consideration that those persons may be at particular risk for becoming addicted to their medications because they have had a past history of addiction. And so that's so elemental, and yet it's not being asked by some physicians. So this is an example. And we have become much better at asking about cigarette smoking and asking about alcohol, uh, but it's much less so about illicit substances. And then when it's asked, then it really, there's no plan on the type of intervention that the doctor is going to be doing if the patient does respond, yes, I do have a problem uh, with drugs. Or even for testing it, you know, many, and I've asked the physicians and they say, no, I feel very uncomfortable asking this person, this question is, is an old lady. How am I going? I'm going to offend her. I'm going to offend her. So this is the question. And if you don't ask, the patient themselves, which feel embarrassed a little bit, are not necessarily going to bring it up themselves. Lastly, Nora, science is going to back you up and back these doctors up. How? 
Well, science provides solutions. I, I always think about it in terms of if you look from the perspective of how we've advanced and um, how the um, medial uh, mean age survival of, of us humans has increased, 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 increased. It's science. It's science that is providing that knowledge that then is applied to change our behaviors and come up with treatment and interventions that can not just expand our lives, but improve the quality of our lives. So I believe that uh, certainly science, I mean, we are funding research to try to get much, uh, I mean, alternative and more medications for the treatment of drug addiction, doing research to try to determine how to actually accelerate the degree of recovery of the brain, wouldn't that be incredible? And, and, and the brain is neuroplastic, so that why don't we take advantage of that opportunity? Also, how do we communicate messages such that you can maximize your prevention for kids not um, experimenting with drugs in ways that, that will actually be disrupting their life later on. How do you do that? How do you maximally uh, have an impact? So these are uh, many of the things that we're currently doing now. Some of these are very, in a way, transformative. We've uh, been funding research now, for example, to come up with vaccines against drugs. So if you are vaccinated, you generate antibodies that would bind to the drug and the drug can never get into the brain. So you can never get high on that drug. So there are multiple alternatives. We could do a whole other episode on that. That's fascinating. I think you point out incredibly importantly that the clinical use of brain mapping should be used and geared toward and around the patient just as much as the researcher when you're analyzing what's going on in here. Well, you know, I love that whole concept that we could use brain images, right? And we could map and I could see what are the areas just like you do right now in your heart where you can uh, identify where, where exactly the myocardial infarction or the ischemia is happening. Imagine if we could do that in the clinics at an accessible price that could tell you this is an area that's not functioning properly and we have learned the rehabilitation process in such a way that I can accelerate the ability of that area of the brain to work uh, back to normal. We'll be, I mean, we, we can do that now, but it's not cost, uh, I mean, it's very, very expensive. It's in the research arena. It's not very fast. And it's, it cannot at this point, we have not developed tools that are specifically tailored to one individual. We're basically at this point trying to understand how to stimulate an area so that it can increase its function and its communication with other areas. But it's not tailored to the person yet. Doctor. Thank you for joining me today. You're very welcome. And thanks to you in the audience. I hope you join us again next time for a thoughtful excursion into the world of ideas. Until then, keep an open mind. Please visit the Open Mind website at 13.org slash open mind to view this program online or to access over 1,500 other interviews. And do check us out on Twitter and Facebook at Open Mind TV for updates on future programming. Continuing production of The Open Mind has been made possible by grants from Ann Olnick Gumowitz, the Engelson Family Foundation, the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, the Joan Gans Cooney and Peter G. Peterson Fund, the Rosalind P. Walter Foundation, the Joanne and Kenneth Wellner Foundation, Sally Menard and Norton Garfinkel, with special thanks to the Schumann Media Center for additional support, and from the Corporate Community, Mutual of America.